Revelation 12, the Feast of Trumpets, and No Man Knows. Over the past few years, a number of internet and YouTube presentations have been posted on the topic of Revelation 12, the Travailing Woman, and the Feast of Trumpets, which occurs on 9-23-2017. Some have speculated that it is possible the rapture slash resurrection will occur on this date. While it is undeniable that the astronomical sign of Revelation 12 will be in the sky on this date, others will argue that the sign itself says nothing with regard to the rapture slash resurrection, for no man can know the day or the hour. They cite the following passages for their argument. Matthew 24, 26, but of that day and hour, knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Mark 13, 32, but of that day and hour, knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but my Father. Matthew 24, 42, watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. Matthew 24, 44. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Matthew 25, 13. Watch therefore, for ye know not neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Mark 13, 33. Take heed, watch, and pray, for ye know not when this time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey, who left his house and gave authority to his servants, and to every man his work, and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house doth come, at even, or at midnight, or at cock crowing, or in the morning. Lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. While it seems to be conclusive that we cannot know, we are left with a problem. If we cannot know the day or the hour, what are we watching for? No one ever has an answer for that question. Perhaps you feel like the guy in the next slide. No man knows the day and hour, so why try to understand it? If the previous verses were the end of the discussion, it might seem to be a foregone conclusion that we cannot know. But what about the following verses? They too need to be factored into the equation. If it is true that we cannot know the day or the hour, why did Paul say it would be at the last trump? See 1 Corinthians 15, 52. Why did Jesus tell the elder of the church of Sardis, if therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Revelation 3.3 3. Why did God tell Amos that he, surely the Lord God, will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret to his servants, the prophets? On the one hand, it seems as though we cannot know, while on the other hand, we are told to watch, and if we do not watch, there are very serious consequences. Most people just get comfortable with the apparent conflict. The apparent conflict is just that, only apparent. Most, if not all of the conflict, stems from a lack of knowledge on, one, the grammar and punctuation, two, the language of the feasts, the temple, and the culture of the New Testament Jew. In a moment, we will be looking at some examples of the above, after which we will provide a link to a free, short, online book that is intended to assist those who want to learn more on what it means to watch for the Second Advent.
grammar and punctuation. Grammar. Grammar is the set of structural rules governing the composition of clauses, phrases, and words in any given natural language. In other words, grammar governs what words we use and how we understand them. Watch. Words mean things. The word watch in both the Greek and English is very particular. In the Greek, it is Gregorio from the Greek 1453 to keep awake. I watch literally or figuratively. Be vigilant, wake, be watchful. English as a verb to be awake, to be awake, to be or continue without sleep, to be attentive, to look with attention or steadiness, watch and see when, to look with expectation, to keep guard, to act as sentinel, to look for danger, to be attentive, to be vigilant in preparation for an event or trial, the time whose arrival is uncertain, to be insidiously attentive, to watch over, to be cautiously observant of, to inspect, superintend, and guard from error and danger. It is simply not possible to effectively watch if you do not know what you are looking for. In order to watch, one must either be trained on what to look for or go straight to the person who has the needed information. The person would be able to, thus the person would be able to discern the true signs from the false signs, avoiding the pitfall of crying wolf. In a moment, we will look at a passage that tells what it means to watch. Punctuation. Punctuation marks are symbols that are used to aid the clarity and comprehension of written language. The use of the colon in literature. The colon is used between independent causes to explain, illustrate, paraphrase, or to expand the first part of the sentence. You can also introduce a list. The use of the colon by the King James translators is very important to understanding the text. It is used to give the reason for the preceding command to watch. Look at the use of the colon in each of the following verses. Matthew 24, 42. Watch therefore, colon, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. Matthew 24, 44. Therefore be ye also ready, colon, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Mark 13. Take ye heed, watch and pray, colon, for ye know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey, who left his house and gave authority to his servants, and to every man his work, and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, colon, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at even, or at midnight, or at cock crying, or in the morning, colon, lest coming suddenly, he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all. Watch. In each of the first four cases, the colon is immediately followed by the conjunction for. The explanation for the command to watch is because they did not know, not because they could not know. This will become abundantly clear when we take a closer look at Matthew 24, 43 through 44. In the fifth case, the colon is followed by the word lest, may. 
a primary particle of qualified negation. See Strong's 3361. Hence, watching negates any chance of being caught sleeping. The word lest infers what will happen if one does not watch. Words. Understanding words by the way they were slash are used. What it means to watch. Matthew 24, 43. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched. It would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Matthew 24, 43-44 Because of the colon, this passage tells us how we are to watch. The good man of the house did not know when the thief would come. This is why we see the word therefore, which means for this reason. Noah Webster, 1828 we are not to be like the good men of the house who failed to watch. Unlike him, we are to find out which watch the thief will come so we will be able to know when to watch for and expect the thief. The bottom line is that if we do not know the hour of his coming, we cannot watch. Who then is the good man of the house and who is the thief? Parallel reading, the cultural language of the New Testament Jews, and the temple service. Parallel reading, by that I mean reading alongside the biblical account. Let me state at the outset, the Bible is the final authority for all matters of faith and practice and where disparities occur between the biblical narrative and extra-biblical literature, our presupposition is that the biblical narrative is correct. While it is true that all we need is found in the Bible, it is also true that God gave us apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists for the equipping of the saints. Over the centuries, these people have written and have been essential to the growth of the church. Some of the above men wrote on the contemporary events, culture, practices, and politics of the day the biblical narrative was recorded. Their literature is not commentary. It is historical. Their writings are a valuable resource to our study as they assist, assist us in better understanding some of what is recorded in the biblical text. These men, in essence, transport us back in time to the very place of the text with all of its physical and cultural surroundings. Understanding, understanding this will be helpful when we consider what it is meant by the good man of the house, the thief in the night, along with the wedding preparations and ceremony of the Jews. The good man of the house. In Israel, both before and at the time of Christ, if a person needed to go on a long journey, and if they had the means, they would hire people to watch over their estate while they were gone. One person was in charge, and it was his job to see to it that the estate was, first of all, secure, and secondly, continued to run while the owner of the home was gone. The person in charge was called the good man of the house. The easiest way to both secure and manage the home was to reside in it while the owner was gone. Breaking into the house was done by digging or breaking a hole in the side of the home. It would be impossible to do this while people were there and attentive. Now tuck this away as we look at how this practice was used as a description of some of the practices in the temple.
The Thief in the Night. The temple was run by a series of 24 courses of priests. Each course had its overseeing elder, chief priest, and attending priests. Each course served a total of two weeks per year. There were three weeks in the year when all of the courses had to be present. Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. The rest of the year, only one course served at a time. While in service, the attendants were housed in quarters in the complex, while the chief priest lived in a nearby apartment. Each of the chief priests were chosen by lot to perform a certain uh, series of temple services. When the chief priests were performing the daily sacrifices, the attendants would be there assisting. While in their service, all had to be ceremonial clean and their clothing kept from stains. All but one of the sacrifices were done on a schedule. The exception was the evening sacrifice. That could be done anytime from 3 p.m. through 6 a.m. The hour was unknown to all but the chief priest chosen to do the task. This created a problem for those living at the temple. They needed to sleep, but also had to be ready at a moment's notice to perform the evening sacrifice. The solution was to set watchmen for each night or each watch of the night. The watchmen were called the good men of the house. In order to be able to serve at a moment's notice, the attending priests removed their garments, folded them and placed them in a nearby place where they could be donned at a moment's notice without getting stained. It was the job of the watchmen, i.e. the good men of the house, to learn which watch of the night the chief priest would come. Sometimes he would ask the chief priest directly, and sometimes he would ask for signals or signs. The watchmen shared the information with each other and all knew what to look for and when to look for it. When the chief priest or the sign was seen, the watchman alerted all of the attending priests who quickly got dressed. When the chief priest stood at the door and knocked, the watchman had to open the door immediately. If after passing inspection, those who passed would go off with the chief priest to perform the sacrifice and dine with him. If any of the attendants were caught sleeping or had dirty garments, they did not pass inspection. The taking of the garments gave the chief priest of the evening sacrifice the nickname thief in the night. The unprepared person would be driven out of the temple into outer darkness naked wearing only his linen cloth under his garments or his undergarments. If the watchman was caught off guard, as we see here, or he was sleeping, he was beaten and the entire course was caught off guard or sleeping and thus robbed of their garments and thrust out naked. In the Matthew 24, 43 passage, we can ascertain by the structure of the sentence that while in the temple, Jesus and the disciples had either just learned of or even witnessed the worst case scenario. The good man of the house, the watchman, did not know which watch the thief was to come. His house was broken up. Hence, he most like, hence it is most likely that some, if not all, of the attending priests were caught unprepared, robbed of their clothing, and thrust out. Two days later, in Mark 14, 52 through 53, in the King James Bible, one of them is seen in the Garden of Gethsemane, wearing only his priestly undergarments, following Jesus as he was arrested and all had forsaken him. But what about our first two original passages? Matthew 24, 26. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, 
not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Mark 13, 32. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but my Father. Despite all of what has been said, most people still default to the above passages as justification for thinking that we cannot know. Once again, it is both the grammar and the punctuation that saves the day. The difference is in the two uses of the word but. In both passages, the first use of but is a conjunction that joins the statement to the previous clause. The second use of the word but is also a conjunction that is serving as a modifier. It is setting up the necessary conditions for negating the previous clause. Let's have a look. But, the word is day, from Strong's 1161 in the Greek, a primary participle, adversative or continuative. It is a conjunction. The yellow but, ye may, from Strong's Greek 1487 and Strong's Greek 3361. If not, but except that, if not more than save, only that saving till. In the Greek, it is a compound word, a conditional participle of which we saw earlier a primary participle of negation. Sidney Collette, in his book, The Scripture of Truth, page 91, 1901, and Greek biologist Archbishop Trench both stated that eme should be translated as if not. It is a compound word. When the King James translators used the word but for eme, they did so properly for the word itself and the sentence structure told them to. The word but, when used as a conditional modifier, as in this passage, has the same meaning as except that, if not, or unless. In fact, the word but is short for Bhutan, meaning except, besides, unless. See Noah Webster 1828. Sidney Collett accused the revision committee of 1870 of having willfully left the word but mistranslated, knowing that the original use in the King James Version had been lost on the original pub on the general public. According to Colette, they willfully obscured the meaning. Their work is re represented in every new translation of the Bible. Thus we have our widespread confusion being taught in the pulpits. Once I had an idea of the Greek word, I took the passages in question to the English department of the school I was working at. I wanted to ask the English experts about the English construction of the passage in the King James Version. When asked, I was told that the second use of the word but is a modifier. It is negating the previous clause by telling us the condition for knowing. When I pressed for clarity, I was told the sentence was structured in such a way so as to communicate that if it were not for the Father, no man, angel of heaven, or the Son could know the day and the hour. In order to know, one had to go to the Father which brings us to yet another topic in our parallel reading. Marriage Customs of the Ancient Jews The Ancient Jewish Wedding the Day of Atonement was the second of the fall feasts. It occurred on Tishri 10, which is our late September, early October. On the night of the 11th, 
which actually started on the evening of the 10th. At midnight, all of the young virgins would take lamps and go out to the vineyards outside of Jerusalem. The young men of the city would then go out and look for a potential bride. If a bride was found, the father, the, the father of the bride and the father of the groom would make a wedding covenant and set the wedding day and hour known only to them. The betrothal was typically a year long, which made the time of the fall festivals the season for weddings. As the time approached, the wedding party was organized with each person assigned their task. Among other assignments were the two witnesses and the ten virgins. You can see the ten virgins here. It was the job of the two witnesses to prepare the groom and have one either retrieve the bride or go out with the groom to retrieve the bride. The job of the ten virgins was very important. According to the custom of the day, the size of the wedding party was seen as an indicator of just how numerous the offspring of the bride would be. It was their job to call people to the wedding procession as they saw that the bride was on her way to the house of the groom's father. When everything was set in the agreed upon hour at hand, the father of the groom sent one witness or the groom and a witness to fetch the bride. The father of the bride pulled back the bride's veil and set the wedding crown on her. When the ten virgins saw the groom coming, they knew it was time to get busy. As the bride was approaching, they went out before her in the city calling people to the wedding procession. As the people came out to greet the bride and join the party, the bride was said to be bringing forth her children. Those virgins who were ill-prepared on what and when things were to take place were not able to complete their assigned task and thus prevented from entering into the wedding party. Everyone in the party had to be in the right place at the right time ready to perform their task. The only way to know when and where they needed to be was to go to either the father of the groom or the father of the bride. Only they knew the day and the hour. Now, take this information and let's consider Matthew 25, 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. At midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there not be enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell, and buy for yourselves. And while they went out to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgin, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch ye therefore, for ye know neither the day or the hour where the Son of Man cometh. Hence, now, our commentary, like the good man of the house, they were the, the wise virgins were able to watch by going to the Father to get the information on what hour to be ready. The foolish virgins did not have that information. It appears as though they were riding on the coattails of those other virgins. Conclusions. The apostles were commanded to watch, for they did not know the day or the hour. Not watching and being unprepared, either by sleep or stained garments, had serious consequences. Number three, watching meant to learn 
when the day and the hour would occur. Number four, in order to know the day and the hour, one must go to the father slash chief priest. Number five, when the signal or the groom, or the chief priest was seen coming, it was the job of the watchman to wake up the priests. Or it was the job of the virgins to specifically call people to the wedding party. These are our conclusions. The final question to ask is, did the father slash chief priest give us the day and the hour, and did he tell us the signals to look for? The answer is yes. In fact, he specifically told us where to look for them. It is in the stars, Genesis 1.14. In fact, the Hebrew word for signs, oath, is probably from the word oath in the sense of appearing a signal. Literally or figuratively, as a flag, a beacon, a monument, omen, prodigy, evidence, mark, a miracle, sign, or token. Strong's Concordance, Hebrews, number 20, 225 and 226. A very clear sign in the heavenlies is described in 1 Corinthians 15, 52 through 53. There is not enough room here to address it. It can be found on pages 30 through 35 of the book listed in the link in this video. I strongly suggest that all who are of the priesthood of believers read the book, if not just the pages. But to the original issue at hand, is there justification based on the concept of no man knows to negate the sign of Revelation 12 and 9.23.17 as any indicator when the rapture will occur. There is not. Let's have a look. On 9.21.17, the moon enters Virgo and she delivers the same day. As soon as she travails, she brings forth. The crown of 12 stars is starting to take shape. On 9-23-17, Virgo will be clothed with the sun, which means the sun will completely obscure, obscure her from sight. Jupiter will have finished its course of nine months. See the addendum in the book link. Read the book. In, ba in the Babylonian imagery, she, that is Virgo, has a veil that is pulled back. They are not wings, as you see in the Greek imagery. She, Virgo, will receive her crown of 12 stars, which is the crown of Horus. See the addendum in the book. Read the book. The new moon will begin to be seen when it passes a star in the hem that is known as Revelation of Mysteries. It will move under Virgo's feet and be fully seen toward the end of the first watch at about 6 p.m. Israel or 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Virgo will have been brought forth, will have brought forth her man child children. See Isaiah 66, 5 through 9 and Revelation 12. Read the book in the link. It is the sighting of the new moon that signaled the start of Tishri 1 or the Feast of Trumpets. Thus, our current calendars make a mistake in this regard. Read the book. There's lots more information in the book. If you have seen this video, you are now accountable. The purpose of the book is to wake up and inform the priesthood of believers on what the signals are with regard to the approach of not only our chief high priest, but also the bridegroom. If you are sleeping or have stained garments, get yourself together. The book is also designed to assist those who would be wise virgins to specifically call people to the wedding feast 
by enabling them to explain the signs of the approaching groom. While the video is to be helpful, it is no substitute for the book. The book is free and listed in a link just below the video. Another free book will also be provided to answer questions regarding the second sign of the Great Red Dragon. Thank you for watching.